Well, good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for attending today, coming out in this cold rain. It's a pleasure to be with you to talk about the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center and our namesake, the Mosaic Templars of America. Last year marked the 10th anniversary of the museum's opening. We've had 10 years of presenting Arkansas African American history, educating thousands of children and adults with quality programs, wonderful exhibits, and insightful presentations. The history of the museum started with an old empty building on Broadway and 9th Streets in Little Rock. The building had been constructed in 1913 by the Mosaic Templars of America, an African American fraternal organization that operated in 26 states and Central America. The building had served as the National Temple, the national headquarters for the Mosaic Templars. It was dedicated by the Mosaic Templar's most well-known member, Booker T. Washington. The structure also represented a landmark to the segregated community of Little Rock. And it was in danger of being demolished for a fast food restaurant in the, er or in the early to mid 1990s. Local residents, historians, and preservationists formed the Mosaic Templar's Building Preservation Society and began a campaign to lobby for the survival of the building. The group started first with the city of Little Rock, who eventually helped them save the structure. Eventually, the Arkansas Legislative Black Caucus took up support of this cause and brought it to the attention of the Arkansas General Assembly. The General Assembly supported the issue and then brought it to the Department of Arkansas Heritage to renovate the building as the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center Arkansas's first publicly funded African American History Museum. The department planned for the renovation and took over the building in January of 2005. On March 16, 2005, fire completely destroyed the building. The state was committed, despite the loss, the state was committed to rebuilding and opened a new museum constructed to faithfully represent the original 1913 structure. Uh, with the opening being on sat Saturday, September 20th, 2018. Today, the museum is still operated by the Department of Arkansas Heritage under the uh, direction of Stacy Hurst. Direct site supervision is under Christina Shutt, the, the director of the museum. Our mission is to preserve, interpret, and celebrate African American history and culture in Arkansas. The museum's signature events include Juneteenth, a celebration of freedom that represents when the last African American was freed from slavery. Also, we have the Say It Ain't Say's Sweet Potato Pie Contest uh, that honors the legacy of local activist Robert Say McIntosh. This afternoon, I will recount some of the history of the Mosaic Templars of America that is uh, mostly known, and I will highlight some of what we have learned about the Mosaic Templars of America in the last 10 years. So the Mosaic Templars of America was founded by two former slaves, John Edward Bush and Chester Keats. It uh, was founded in 1882. And it was founded as a burial insurance society to help African Americans bury their dead. Uh, the official history that the Mosaic Templars wrote in 1924 uh, published an account by John Bush as to uh, what the impetus was that started the, uh, this organization. So this is John Bush's own words. The one thing above all, there, all others that inspired me, I as well as Mr. Keats, to attempt the organization of an order of this nature was an effort to put a stop to the public solicitation of funds to aid sick people or bury the dead. It used to be a common thing to see someone with a list soliciting funds to bury some poor person whose family was unable to defray funeral expenses. I have so often been embarrassed while talking to some prominent white person when some old colored woman would come up and ask for a donation to bury some colored man who had been a citizen of the community all his life and had held good positions. The white man would often give her the donation and then turn to me with an oath and ask why Negroes did not save some money in order that they could be buried decently when they died. Here the thought was given birth, which finally culminated in the organization of the Mosaic Templars of America. The Templars took their name from 
the Exodus story and Moses in the Bible. Mosaic is actually a derivative of Moses. So they saw a parallel between the Mosaic Temperance Organization and the Exodus story. As Moses had led the children of, of Israel, the Israelites, out of Egyptian bondage, slavery, into the Promised Land, they saw the Mosaic Templars of America helping uh, former slaves, helping African Americans uh, basically move into a better life, to help them to under, understand the freedom, to, to actually help them to understand what it meant to be free. They chose as their seal, uh, again building on the story, uh, the Exodus story. This is the seal uh, that represents the Mosaic Templars. Of course you see MTA, which stands for Mosaic Templars of America. Two, what looks like an X in the center, two cross shepherd staffs represents Moses and Aaron. And then you've got the three V's, which was a favorite motto of John Edward Bush. That literally means I came, I saw, I conquered. It's historically been attributed to Julius Caesar, but we really don't know the origin of that phrase. Now, I want you to remember three V's because it's going to come back later in the presentation. Um, around the MTA and the shepherd's staffs is a snake eating its tail called an Ouroboros, which represents uh, a cycle of life and death. And greenery, that also represents new, uh, new birth or new life. So this was the symbol of the Mosaic Templars that they chose to represent themselves. Now most people joined to get a burial policy or a death policy. This is a sample of one that was created originally in 1923. There's not too many of these around. Um, one thing that makes it hard to, to understand the full history of the Mosaic Templars is when they ceased their operations, they kept no uh, corporate archives. So records are scattered. Um, the policies that we have actually came from members who outlived the organization. So we know that there's still records out there, and that's one of the things that uh, myself and other historians at the museum have been working on in the last 10 years is to try to locate records, uh, locate information about what, the, uh, what and who the Mosaic Templars of America were. Um, we uh, have been able to acquire several documents, but uh, a treasure trove of information is coming from digitized records. And it could be newspaper <coughs> articles, other publications, secondary source publications, but also government records. Everyone has to do business at the courthouse at some time in their life. And so courthouse uh, records, those that have survived fires, uh, are another excellent repository of the history of the Mosaic Templars of America. Now, one new document that did surface in 2016 that we were able to acquire was an original application to join the Mosaic Templars of America. While they may have been a burial society, they were really uh, they really took an interest in the health of their membership uh, because if they were going to invest their money in you, they wanted you to be healthy. So basically there were prerequisites, health conditions that would keep you from becoming a member. Uh, the application is a short application, but it asked for a complete medical history. You actually had to take the application to a local physician and have tests run. There was, um, so for example, when you're signing the first part of the application, it says, I hereby certify that I'm not subject to a periodical complaint, consumption, dyspepsia, pathysis, heart disease, or any other complaint that is liable to shorten life or render me a burden to the Mosaic Templars. Uh, it continues to go on. It wants a complete family history. Um, is your father still living? Is your mother still living? How old are they? If they're deceased, what age were they when they passed? What caused their death? Uh, do you have any other relatives that have died early? Do you have any other relatives now or in the past that have had tuberculosis, cancer, rheumatism? Um, as far as um, 
the instructions to the physician, the uh, application actually required a urine test. And it asked for the doctor to complete color, the reaction, the specific gravity, uh, the albumin, the level of sugar, and whether or not there were abnormal deposits within the urine sample. So, and from what I have gathered by studying the document at length, just because you completed an application and sent it in, it still had to be approved by the medical department before they would formally accept you as a member. So this is a new document that has really added a lot of light into uh, how the Templars accepted members. Now, in the Constitution that they wrote, and we actually do not have an original 1888 Constitution. We have a revised copy that was published in 1912. Again, a lot of these medical conditions are actually listed in there as this is what will disqualify you as a member of the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. Or, uh, sorry, Mosaic Templars of America. The, uh, and then speaking of the medical department, um, the medical department was the uh, idea of Dr. John Thornton. Dr. Thornton um, married Charlotte Stevens, Little Rock's first African-American history teacher. And so there were strong connections between this family because uh, the, the official history said that uh, Miss Charlotte Stevens actually helped John Bush create some of the works, the writings, uh, the rituals used by the Mosaic Templars. And so Dr. Thornton himself, um, actually, well, I'm sorry if I got this wrong, actually married Bessie Stevens, that was Charlotte's daughter. I might have misspoken earlier, but um, Dr. Thornton actually created a, a resolution in one of the national meetings uh, to become the national medical director, and he became the medical director to head the medical department. One of the things that he wanted to propose was a national hospital. This hospital, um, the, eventually, was the uh, city of Hot Springs, Arkansas, was chosen to be the location for this hospital. Now, we do know that the official history mentions and actually has a physical description um, of what the hospital was to be. But in the last 10 years, we have actually learned a lot about this hospital, where it was planned to be built, why it was not constructed. So the Mosaic Templars actually purchased property, Block 53 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, for a total of $35,000. It had been the site of the Park Hotel, which was a very large structure. Uh, you can actually look at the Park Hotel on the uh, Sanborn Fire Insurance map and see all of the multiple structures on several acres there in Hot Springs. So it had been destroyed in 1913 by the largest urban fire in, in Arkansas history. So the uh, block had actually been cleared and the Templars bought that. Now, one of the things that the Mosaic Templars thought was attached with the property was access to the thermal hot springs or the hot waters from the National Park Service. They were controlled by the National Park Service. That was not actually the case. So the Mosaic Templars, before they built this, went through the process to apply for a permit to get access to the hot waters. Um, over here on the right is a copy of the actual, uh, from the real estate book in the Garland County Circuit Clerk's Office uh, of the deed. So the parties that were involved in the, these negotiations were the Mosaic Templars Attorney General, Scipio A. Jones, and the National Park Service Director, which was Arno Kammerer. Now, there were a lot of political supporters, some heavyweights in Arkansas politics that were supporting the Mosaic Templars. The first one was U.S. Congressman Henderson Jacoway. Henderson Jacoway actually uh, brought Scipio Jones to Washington, D.C. to meet with uh, Arner, Arno Kammerer in person. And so this is a letter that, uh, a, that Director Kammerer wrote to uh, the superintendent of Hot Springs. He says, Congressman Jacoway tells me that this is a high-grade colored organization, speaking about the Mosaic Templars, and you can undoubtedly readily ascertain and all of the information you need regarding their standing. 
Mr. Jones says that the governor and various people in Little Rock will readily vouch for them. Well, who was the governor at the time, and who were these other people that would vouch for the Mosaic Templars? Governor Thomas McRae was one. And then the insurance commissioner, Bruce T. Bullion. And Mr. Bullion will also pop up later in uh, the history of the Mosaic Templars before my presentation is done today. But uh, Kammerer also wrote that uh, he had received favorable recommendations of Governor, Governor McRae and Insurance Commissioner uh, Bullion among the exhibits attached within this correspondence. So these are all coming from correspondence that is in the, the archives at Hot Springs National Park. So this is a photograph of what the Mosaic Templars wanted to construct in Hot Springs. Had they been able to secure uh, the hot water permit, would have been located near the other two African American bathhouses um, in Hot Springs off Malvern Avenue. Malvern Avenue was the main business district, the African American business district in the city of Hot Springs. The Knights of Pythias, which was another fraternal, African American fraternal organization, opened uh, a bathhouse there in uh, 1914. And then the Woodmen of the Union built a bathhouse and hotel and auditorium in 1922. So the property that the Mosaic Templars had acquired was sort of catty cornered for the Woodmen of the Union. So um, this is what uh, the Templars wanted to see happen in Hot Springs, Arkansas. However, what happened was, despite all of the political support, uh, despite the good reputation of the Mosaic Templars of America, the National Park Service denied them a permit. Um, uh, Director Cameron wrote Scipio Jones himself in a letter dated March 2nd, 1923, and of the, what he said was, he explained his decision. He told Jones that uh, the Woodman of the Union Hotel was adequately serving all the demands made by colored bathers. Furthermore, the Pythian bathhouse, let me back that up, um, was actually closed, was undergoing uh, renovation, and once it had been completed, it would offer additional facilities for African Americans. Also, the Mosaic, or, uh, the National Park Service was actually worried about a shortage, a potential shortage with the water. So they, um, Cameron found, or, uh, additionally said, aside from the impracticability, impracticability of our supplying waters from the reservation for additional tubbage outside the grounds, which is out of the question in view, the demands made on us for the existing water supply, your application is therefore denied. Now, this didn't stop the, um, the dream of the Mosaic Templars to provide health care. They also had a uniform rank department as one of their divisions that did promote physical fitness because the Mosaic Templars, while they uh, promoted uh, thrift and living, um, basically not living beyond your means, they also heavily supported physical fitness and the health of African Americans. So the Templars lost the permit or didn't get the permit. They eventually sold their property. Uh, November 29th, 1929, they sold the block to Louise and Leftridge Basham for $39,500, payable to, in 10 uh, promissory notes with 6% interest. Um, just a cool fact about the Bashams, uh, they owned a car dealership in Hot Springs that sold Studebaker and Packard cars. So the uh, Mosaic Templars uh, within the Arkansas State Temple, they decided that they would take on the uh, issue of building a hospital in Arkansas. So while there are secondary sources out there today that say that the Mosaic Templars actually located their hospital in the National Temple Annex building, which was actually between the Arkansas State Temple and the National Temple. The hospital itself was actually in the Arkansas State Temple. 
Um, so this is a photograph of the Arkansas State Temple. Um, and so the hospital was actually located on the second floor. It provided, a, or it could accommodate 30 uh, beds. And it, was, it became known as the Mosaic State Hospital. The officers in charge of this hospital was Peach Jordan, uh, John Thornton, Lena Lowe Jordan, and Percy Dorman. Now, Peach Jordan, there's, there's a lot of contributions he made to the Mosaic Templars story. I can't go through all of them now, um, but they are quite interesting. But Peach Jordan was the man most responsible for having the state temple constructed. And his wife was Lena Lowe Jordan, who was a nurse. And so the two of them uh, really were the impetus behind constructing this hospital. Thornton, was, as head of the medical department, took over the, as medical director for the hospital. And Percy Dorman basically was an administrator that worked, uh, in, the, in, the, in, worked in the background, so to speak. So um, two years after opening, the Mosaic Templars was able to acquire a, a charter to train nurses. So again, this shows the long-term dedication for providing health care to the African-American community in Little Rock. Now, the hospital did not stay in existence very long. It uh, closed in 1932, uh, but it still continued to appear in the, uh, as late as the January 1933 Little Rock phone book. So what made the hospital close? Well, what made the hospital close is what actually made the National Temple close. Now, in previous histories, um, historian Blake Winery, who many of you know, uh, found the lawsuit that the Bush family filed in 1925. They sued the organization for the copyrights for all of the works for the rituals. And that, in the end, was a contributing factor as to why the Templars lost the property here in Little Rock. But what actually led to the demise of the property was a mortgage that was taken out by the Mosaic Templars uh, in 1930. It was a mortgage on property that the Mosaic Templars owned in Cross County, which uh, consisted of 800 acres of land. Uh, Faulkner County had 544 acres of land that was mostly under culti cultivation near Mayflower. Um, there were two parcels that includes the, the National Temple, the Annex, and the Arkansas State Temple in Little Rock in Pulaski County. And then 763 acres of fertile land in St. Francis County. So um, CPO Jones actually signed a mortgage deed and, and sent it to the Union Investment Company of America, which was based in Hot Springs. Union Investment Company was actually part of the Woodman of the Union organization. So um, it it was a total for 67000 and some change. Um, it was payable in six notes. First six notes were due um, at $12,000 each. The uh, sixth note was for just a little under $8,000. Now, what was specified in the mortgage was that if any note was defaulted upon, the remaining amount would be due immediately. So this actually is a copy filed in the uh, Chancery Court in Cross County and Wynn uh, of that first note. So what happens, the Union Investment Company, um, they filed a, a claim in the uh, circuit court or the Chancery Court that said that the Templars had defaulted. Now this was, this turned into be a multiple uh, party lawsuit and I'm not a, an attorney but it was a very long lawsuit to try to read through and I'm going to try to summarize it here but there's a lot of there are some other related court cases that I have not actually had time to pursue yet um, but we get we can understand based on this one court case what actually happened to the Mosaic Templars um, so we see that the, uh, well, starting out, the Templars were having some financial difficulty. Um, 
In 19... Let me back up. Hold on a second. Okay. In 1930, Ursula Bush and the Bush family initially filed a second claim in the Pulaski County Chancery Court saying that the Mosaic Templar still owed them over $24,000 for, for the rituals and the rites. July 19th, the Mosaic Templars went into receivership. The first mortgage was due just a little less than a year later in March of 1931. Um, April 7, 1931, the investment company then claimed the Mosaic Templars defaulted on the mortgage note, filed a lawsuit in Cross County Chancery Court to foreclose. Also named was another defendant along with the Mosaic Templars. Uh, Beatrice Brown uh, was named because she had just won a judgment in Cross County against the Cross County property owned by the Mosaic Templars. So she was uh, named as a defendant because she had an interest on the property in Cross County. Um, the Bush family also tried to get into this lawsuit. They wanted to intervene as a creditor in the foreclosure suit. They stated that the Bush family, or the Bush family stated that the Mosaic Templar officers had exceeded their authority in making this uh, mortgage loan and that the Union Investment Company should have known that the Templars were insolvent. So the whole loan was, was an act of fraud. Um, also, with the accelerated, basically, payment system that was put in for the deed so that the total amount was due, that preempted their uh, promissory notes that the Templars owed them for the copyright claims. So um, they felt like that they had an interest now in some of this property and that they were going to be denied what, was the, what the Templars still owed them. Um, yes, ma'am. She was a uh, descendant, she, or a daughter-in-law, uh, Chester Bush's wife. So she was a guardian of Chester's children who actually named, was the, um, the, the folks that actually launched the lawsuit. But since they were considered minors, she was the guardian, and so she actually filed it as the guardian. The rich, um, that's a good question. The rituals basically for membership into the uh, local chapters. There were rituals just like you would have a ritual in, if you were like in uh, the Masons or um, uh, uh, Eastern, Star. Eastern Star. So they actually were claiming copyright on the actual rituals. Um, Less than a month later, in May of 1931, Scipio Jones then filed paperwork with the court to ask for more time to liquidate some of these properties so that they could actually pay for the uh, mortgage notes. Um, May 30th, Scipio Jones then filed an answer to the complaint. He also submitted a cross-complaint against the Union Investment Company. He stated that the Union Investment Company had only paid the Mosaic Templars $52,500 instead of $60,000, which was originally asked for. They said that uh, the remaining $7,500 was misrepresented by the Union Investment Company, which then made an overall total of just under $68,000, which that total amount, if you break that down based on the calculations of the Mosaic Templars and CPL Jones, was more than 15% annual interest, which was in violation of the Arkansas State Constitution, uh, known as the usury law. So, Scipio Jones was saying that now, the Union Investment Company's claim, all the notes should be made null and void because they were in violation of the state's usury laws. Um, they also claimed that the Union Investment Company used undue influence in pressuring them um, into this, this agreement. Uh, a few days later, another party comes to the table and files paperwork. A.C. Logan, who was a member of the Mosaic Templars, came forward. He filed paperwork as an uh, intervener, as a shareholder of the Mosaic Templars. He stated that what was agreed to in this mortgage deed violated the Constitution of the Mosaic Templars of America because, as he said and his attorney, that the property was actually financial reserves for the mortuary fund. The mortuary fund, fund is what actually paid the member benefits, that paid the 
for the tombstones, to pay for uh, the members to be buried. So he was saying that it basically uh, was fraud. And so he was asking, as a shareholder, uh, and that the lawsuit be dismissed. So there's a lot of parties in this lawsuit asking for a lot of different things, a lot of, a lot of different claims. So what happened, the court came back December 31st, 1931, and they ruled in the favor of the Union Investment Company in Hot Springs. Uh, because Beatrice Brown had won a judgment against the, the Templars for the Cross County property, it was removed from the lawsuit. Scipio Jones was then ordered by the court to turn over the MTA properties in Faulkner, Pulaski, and St. Francis counties. Scipio Jones' cross-complaint was dismissed with prejudice. The Bush family and A.C. Logan's interventions were dismissed outright, as the court said the complaints would go against the general receivership of the Mosaic Templars and not against this property. So on January 9th, 1932, Scipio Jones formally turned over the property in a deed that included the National Temple in Little Rock, the Temple Annex, and the Arkansas State Temple in Little Rock, the properties on 9th and Broadway, turned them over to John L. Webb, who was a trustee for the Union Investment Company, and he was also the founder of the Woodman of the Union build, or, uh, and, and was responsible for the construction of the Woodman of the Union building in Hot Springs. So, what we still don't know is when did the Templars vacate the structure? The Union Investment Company was actually asking in one of their complaints to the court that this be uh, the judgment, they asked for the judgment in their favor, but they also wanted to find someone to rent the facility so that they could uh, earn rent to help pay for the Mosaic Templars debts. Did the Mosaic Templars stay in the building and pay rent? We don't know. Um, they were last actually mentioned, I think, in the city directory in 1931. So this was in early 1932. So there's still a few questions that are still yet to be answered about what happened to the Mosaic Templars. Because we know that there were other Templar organizations in state chapters that continued, that survived longer than, than what happened in Arkansas. Um, the state of Alabama, the last mention of them in uh, records, newspaper accounts, is 1938. I'm going to show you a photograph here in a couple of slides of a state chapter meeting in Tennessee in 1934. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and there were three buildings there. There was the National Temple, the Temple Annex, and then the Arkansas State Temple. So the National Temple is not there anymore? That was the building that was supposed to become the museum that burned in 2005. Okay. So there's still yet. Now, are we going to answer every one of these questions? Perhaps, perhaps not. But we're still looking as, as we have time, um, as records unfold, as records become digitized. And hopefully we will. We're going to do our best to try to find out these answers. Because the story of the Mosaic Temples of America, it's a Little Rock story, Pulaski County story. But it's a story that transcends Arkansas. It's a national story. It's an international story. Um, because the state of Alabama, for one, actually had more members than the state of Arkansas. And there is still one chapter located in Barbados today. Question that I was asked early on when I first started working here is, can we actually prove Booker T. Washington was a member? Questions had been asked, was the Mosaic Templars just using him because he was a political figure, and he did support the Mosaic Templars. So one of the, uh, I found, I came across a newspaper article here that appeared in the Indianapolis Freeman, January 15th, 1916. 
And it says, a letter to, to J.E. Bush, Grand Scribe of the National Mosaic Temples of America, from Emmett Scott, Secretary of Tuskegee Institute, and also the Secretary of Booker T. Washington, has been made public, acknowledging the receipt for Mrs. Booker T. Washington of a check for $500, representing the amount of insurance held by the late educator in the Mosaic Order. So we know Booker T. Washington was a member because now we have evidence that the Mosaic Templars actually paid out on his death benefit. Now, Booker T. Washington himself is buried in the campus cemetery on Tus at Tuskegee University. Now, there are, since there were uh, members in 26 states, we know that there is evidence of the Mosaic Templars that have yet to be discovered and found. Occasionally, Mosaic Templars Cultural Center staff are allowed to travel out of state. It's usually going to conferences. For me, I usually try to find a, a destination that is directly in, in the pathway that I'm traveling, and I'll try to stop and do some research. So in 2010, I had a chance to stop off at Tuskegee. And there in the Tuskegee Cemetery, the same cemetery Booker T. Washington is buried in, is a Mosaic Temple of America gravestone. Um, also speaking, staying with Alabama, I mentioned earlier that it was the largest jurisdiction in, in the Mosaic Temples of America. I had a chance to track down where the state temple was for Alabama. In 2012, um, I tracked down the actual location, took these photographs, but the temple for the state of Alabama was located in downtown uh, Montgomery right across the street from the Montgomery City Hall and Auditorium, five blocks from Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, and seven blocks from the Alabama uh, State Temple, or State Capitol, I'm sorry. But there was also a Sanborn map from 1910 that you see here in this inset that shows the actual footprint of the building. And so we were, I was able to actually place it uh, here on this map to show you the physical location of where it was located in relation to everything else in downtown um, Montgomery. Of course, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, King Memorial Baptist Church, was the, the, uh, one of the churches that Dr. Martin Luther King uh, pastored at, and he also planned and organized the Montgomery bus boycott from the basement. So we know that this was an area of a lot of African American activity and history. And this is in the Mosaic Templars of Alabama, was in the middle of it all. Just last summer, I was able to stop in Tennessee, visit the grave of Tennessee State Grandmaster John Watt Reddick. He was born in 1880, died in 1941. Now, we know a lot about Reddick. We actually have acquired uh, three documents on the MTA letterhead that he signed. And he, would, he signed all the letters, yours in three V's. Again, a reference to the three V's that's in the Mosaic Templars of America logo, or the uh, symbol. Um, this is a photograph of Reddick. Reddick still has family in the area. I have been able to speak to a few of them. And um, his name is still on uh, several buildings in Franklin, including there's a street even named after Reddick. He was an Army veteran, um, and he died uh, right before World War uh, II started. But this is his grave. It's, again, it's not a Mosaic Templars of America grave because he was one of the, the many people that outlived the organization. But uh, one thing that the Heritage Foundation in Franklin has is a photograph of a state temple meeting from 1934. Again, this is kind of all new information that we've learned in the last 10 years right here. Now, tracking the Mosaic Templars outside the United States is, can be even more difficult. But um, a question I've been asked is, is the Barbadian group actually tied to the group in Little Rock? Well, I've heard that they are, there, are, uh, there is information in the Barbados National Archives, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to visit Barbados anytime soon. But I do know that the district 
uh, the Mosaic Templar District of Central America was located in Panama. This is a publication, a magazine called the West Indian Progress, published, I believe, in Panama City from 1917. And there is a letter to the editor section, and it talks about the Mosaic Templars. And I just want to read you a couple of passages that I have highlighted up here. Um, one, it starts off here, Today the National Order of the Mosaic Templars of America has forged its way from one of obscurity to the front ranks of the Negro Fraternal Orders. The founders of the order were two young Negroes, viz. J.E. Bush and C.W. Keats. Their history reads like a chapter from the Arabian Nights. C.W. Keats, after serving for years as the national head of the order, surrendered to the Grim Reaper and passed to his reward in the year 1908. You've got to love the way the authors of that time wrote articles. That's in the uh, left column. In the right column here uh, is, is a small section here. The National Order of the Mosaic Templars of America was organized in 1882 by Negroes in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas. So this, again, is proof that the Mosaic Templars of America started right here in Little Rock in 1882, had a direct connection to Mosaic Templars outside the United States, at least in the country of Panama. Now, one way that we track members today, let me check my time, I'm almost out. Um, we, it all, we all owe it to the monument department that was created by the uh, Mosaic Templars. Uh, this was a statement that, that comes from the official history book that says, the, this department, or the department is now considered indispensable in that it has been the means by which so many of the graves of the deceased members would have been lost to the world had it not been for these monuments being furnished. And that is so true, because if the Mosaic Templars didn't exist, they would not have produced markers. We would not know or would not be able to track the extent that the Mosaic Templars were involved in the lives of African Americans around this nation without the Monument Department. Um, now the Monument Department it was the company that actually produced the Mosaic Templar stones. Now, in the original burial policy, you would have to submit when you died, your family, or actually it was a local chapter director, you actually had to have an undertaker sign off, a physician at the time of death sign off, as well as the local officers. Now, another form that we have acquired in the last 10 years is a monument claim form, which based on the names, the officers, it uh, dates from 1922 to 1928. Again, this is something that in order to get your marker, the local chapter officers would have to submit this in along with your burial insurance policy. So how do you identify? What's the characteristics of most of the Mosaic Templar of America markers? Round forward sloping top, two notches along the edge. Um, what I have observed is heights between 25 and 29 inches, width of 15 to 17 inches, and a depth of 3 to 5 inches. Now a lot of these actually will sink below ground. So they may appear shorter than 25 to 29 inches. But um, if you dig just slightly below the surface, you're going to be able to hit the information. These are three examples showing some slight variations to these markers. But the marker itself, actually, I treat it as a historic document because it had the name of the deceased. And really, though, besides the overall shape, you see the Mosaic Templars of America logo at the top. Or the, but it's got the name of the deceased, whoops, uh, the date they were born, if known, the date they died, and then it's got the local chapter name, chapter number, and the city and state. So uh, what we are doing now with these markers is I've developed the National Mosaic Templars of America membership registry. We now have it uh, on our website. It's fully searchable. We launched this in October of 2013 with only 500 names because we started this with one name. Um, as of uh, January 31st, we have just a little over 1,800 names. And I have received uh, probably six names in the last couple of weeks. 
because February is our busiest month, I haven't had a chance to update it yet, but um, the membership registry is being used by professional archaeologists, genealogists, historians, museum professionals, uh, people that just have, have an interest in a family cemetery, a church cemetery. Uh, when they Google what this icon is on the marker, the Mosaic Templar, Templars of America logo, the seal, it leads them to our website. And so now, if, if you click, you can go to our homepage, and if you look for uh, research and then research MTA members, you've got a, sort of a small FAQ up top that helps you to recognize the characteristics. And then if you go down to the bottom of the page, then you can start searching. So this is slowly being built one grave at a time or one member. Now, sometimes we will find names mentioned in documents, uh, sometimes court records, sometimes in newspaper articles. So we will add those to the registry. But um, a lot of times researchers will use it. They won't find the person that they have found. They'll contact me. And that's a way then that we know that there's another Mosaic Templar member out there now that we can actually add to the list. Because when I first got here, I read a lot about what the Mosaic Templars were, what they did. Now we actually can start building a face. Who were the members? Who were the individuals that made up this organization? So um, we have a list of a lot of members and we're always open to volunteer genealogists if they'd like to do research on these members. We do have some individual histories on a few, not a lot, but on a few. Uh, but it is one way that uh, we are continuing the legacy and building the legacy. Now, what is the uh, future? What is in our future? What is in the future of the Mosaic Temples of America legacy? Well. March 8, 2017, the Department of Arkansas Heritage was able to purchase the original Arkansas State Temple building. It, of the three buildings that were there on the corner, it is the only original structure. Uh, it, re it had been painted a couple of different uh, colors, but when the state purchased it, they went through a full renovation, and they tried to restore it. Tommy Jamison was the architect that uh, worked on the building. He was the architect that worked on the original 1913 building before it was destroyed by fire. He worked on the designs for the new museum. He worked on this structure and uh, did his best to uh, renovate the external to that 1924 photo that we see. So um, over about, well, less than two years, the department renovated the facility. And they did not renovate it as a museum. So it's not actually part of the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. It is, though, still part of the Mosaic Templars of America legacy. So it's been made a modern office space. On the first floor is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. On the second floor is the Arkansas Health Services Permit Agency. And they had the dedication, the ribbon cutting, uh, just this month, February 1st. And as you can see in the photograph, um, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, along with the newly elect, elected Little Rock Mayor Frank Scott, cut the ribbon to open officially and to dedicate the renovated Mosaic Temples of America State Temple. For the museum itself, the museum began planning for the future by producing a strategic plan in 2017, um, which helped us to begin the actual process of, of planning. This can be downloaded. Here's a copy of the, the front page. It can be downloaded from the museum's website. We also began to work with an exhibit design company called Exhibit Concepts to create a new interpretive master plan to help drive the future development of new programs, signage, retail space, exhibits, and visitor flow. The project was broken into three phases. Phase one included the creation of the, the master plan. Uh, phase two included what you see here, creating designs. And I've just pulled three from the sample. So we've just now completed phase two. Now, in just a few weeks, sometime this spring, we will be launching a new capital campaign. It's going to be titled Innovate, Collaborate, and Renovate. That's the logo for our new capital campaign. So 
Um, if you're interested in more about our capital campaign, you can contact the museum. But uh, you'll be hearing more about that when we do a public launch. Um, so these, this again is just a little bit about what we have uh, in preparations for our future. One last thing, I know I'm out of time, but we are currently completing the professional accreditation process through the American Alliance of Museums. Now we haven't been officially accredited yet, but we're almost through the process. So what this simply means is that we have achieved the level of, of benchmarks that's been established for the, pro, pro, for the profession of being a museum and a cultural institution. So um, that is the end of the program. This is just some of the things about our history, what we've learned in the last 10 years, where we're going into the future. So um, I'll be around for, to answer a few questions if anyone has any. So I want to thank everybody for coming out.